Hi all. I'm in the mood to continue my exploration of Kotov's classic book Think Like a Grandmaster, which to me I think should have been called Think Like a Machine. In fact, be before going on to the concrete second example of Kotov, he says early on in his book, basically, that um, he was revealing to other chess players, he was writing a book about analysis, and he was learning from other grandmasters about analysis and also what he discovered himself. And then he went on to say, Botvinnik is working hard at trying to make a computer play chess as well as a human being. So let me teach human beings to analyse with the accuracy of a machine. Now, it's unclear actually when this book was first published, but um, the evidence is there in the book that um, Kotov was a friend of Mikhail Botvinnik, who was working on the early chess computers. And at that time, the concept of brute force hadn't been um, so clear as now, that computers, as they simply got quicker and faster, they could use very simple heuristics with greater and greater effect. The heuristics, the rules of thumb that govern how to evaluate a position, um, it was actually the, the actual calculating speed which made computers more and more dangerous, especially tactically. So anyway, coming to Kotov's second example, he writes that he was particularly discouraged in his game with Panov, where Panov was black against him, and a sharp opening position was reached. Now, I've actually looked up this game because I want to show the full context of it. Panov, by the way, is, I believe, the same Panov as in the Panov Botvinnik attack of the Karakhan defence. Very sharp uh, play, a, a good system against the Karakhan. So it was a very dangerous attacking player, not to be underestimated. And if Kotov had really learned to analyse variations, you'd expect, you know, that he'd have a better second encounter against Panov. Um, in, in virtually the same opening, the Fianchetto variation of the King's Engine. But as it so happens, in 1940, he lost a second time to Panov, playing white, in the Fianchetto variation of the King's Engine. So this was the first encounter in 1936. So Kotov with white played this variation. And I believe, you know, when GMs do play this variation, they're avoiding a lot of the main lines where black is having a very, you know, stereotypical pawn storm against their king. King safety shouldn't be such an issue. Um, but Kotov, you know, uses this example that he's very critical with his thinking in his notes that, um, you know, to what a laughable extent his, his play, his thinking was based on general principles and plans. But if we consider the King's Engine as a very closed sort of opening, you know, it's not like the open lines, you know, of E4, you know, in, in the very sharp tactical variations. It is closed in nature and positional in nature. There's often a justification for thinking more positionally. So Cotter with White started with these moves. And here, for example, if you're white, you might consider knight e1 to d3 with the idea of c5. So, you know, black's trying to get control of that c5 square. It's typical King's Engine stuff. Kotov, though, he plays queen c2, so he's reinforcing the e4 pawn, and black plays a5, so black wants to reinforce that c5 outpost. Now Kotov plays a3. There's nothing wrong with white's play so far. In fact, you know, you have to think strategically here that white is aiming, you know, often for b4 and then for c5 often at the right time to get a sort of attack on the pawn chain going at the exploitable base of the pawn chain. Black plays knight c5, and here, um, you know, maybe he got a bit frightened here. You know, why didn't he play b3? Is there a tactical reason why b3 is not playable? Well, maybe there is, because maybe black can play a4 here. So has Kotov already gone a bit wrong if black's already better here after b3? Because ideally, white would want to be preparing, you know, uh, to play b4. So after knight c5, it seems as though Kotov changes plan completely away from queenside expansion. And his next move isn't really consistent with the idea of playing for b4. He plays actually bishop e3. And it is controversial, the idea of giving up the dark squared bishop. Because potentially, you know, black's bishop is going to be useful on the dark squares later. So the game um, progressed with knight g4, which is just provoked. Yeah, because he hasn't prepared this bishop um, e3 move. If he had prepared it with h3, you know, according to Ribka, black's actually better here just by playing a4, just clamping down on white playing b4. So 
so he goes on in for this bishop e3 uh, line. So he gives up that dark squared bishop. And the point I want to make is that in the example position where Kosov didn't see all the combinations coming up soon, he was actually worse. You know, Blatt's got this dangerous um, bishop which, which can later, you know, become very useful. And also, um, we'll see that this rook was activated by Kosov. So positionally, you know, it's as if, you know, Kosov has created at least two tactical liabilities now in this position. This active rook and this bishop, as we're about to see. So rook a, b, 1. As if the b4 plan is, is effective. It's not. Uh, a recent uh, Morozovic game in the last Olympiad, Morozovic had used this bishop takes c5 plan, but his follow-up was something like rook d1 and d6. D and, you know, he later just won the ending because his rook came in like to b6 and he was winning black's queenside pawns. So if you're going to do give up this bishop, um, you know, there has to be a clear plan behind it. So it's as if Kotov's mixed up a few plans and he's still playing for this b4 move. And the ridiculous thing now is that after black gets in this formatic f5, Kotov doesn't seem to care much about his king's safety or black being able to play f4 later. He plays b4 anyway, and now we, there comes bishop f8. So I believe, you know, black's almost better now. Rivka, though, um, suggests b5 as a strong move here. And even b takes c, actually, is given as a reasonable move. But I'm sure this will backfire, because this bishop seems too strong. So let's follow a bit the evaluation here. Queen c1, say f4. I think black must be at least equal in this kind of position, with that menacing dark squared bishop. So knight b5, say say um, queen, queen e7. Anyway, the evaluation is only slightly in favour for white now, so it's gone down a bit. G takes f4, just accepting the pawn sack. And if black has knight f7, you know, black seems to be fine in this kind of position. There's compensation in terms of the dark squares. And, um, you know, black's got very active pieces. So black does seem to be fine. If we roll back now, so this bishop f8, Kotov played knight a2 and you know it's not as if his positional play has been very good here that um you know where, where has black's pawn chain been undermined b4 just seems like a really poxy idea here just you know liberating the bishop if he's going to take on c5 and if he's not going to take on c5 he's going to give black an active rook and in fact after knight f7 black is now threatening f4 and if white ever takes on f4 black will get e5 for the knight so it's as if, you know, black's positional play is strategically crushing um, to Kotov at the moment. 